sure a lot of you know that the New York Times is, uh, is known for having the, the, some of the world's best uh, journalists working here. Um, what's also not as widely known um, is that a lot of the world's best software developers work here. Uh, that's actually a quote from, from Wired.com recently. Um, and so I wanted to kick this event off. I introduce my colleague, Andre. By the way, speaking of uh, the best software developers working in the world, we know that not all of them do work here, so if you would like to be one of them, we accept resumes anytime. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to see all of you here at a Times Open event. I can remember a couple of years ago sitting on the floor of a conference room that they herded us all into and said, guys, we've got this idea to have a hack day. We get people to hack our APIs and build cool stuff. But one problem, we didn't have any APIs at all. And so we, we didn't have one that year. The next year, however, suddenly we had APIs for articles, APIs for congressional APIs, <coughs> voter information, we have financial information. We have APIs just rolling out as fast as we can make them. We have sort of nerdy ones that only we would do. We have ones that people do very surprising things to me with about our articles, and they're there for you to use. The whole point of this when we started out was to let developers know that and let them know about it, but it sort of expanded in scope. And it's now become sort of a, just a regular nerd fest that we want to host because we love technology and we love the liberal arts and we love hacking on stuff. So now we are in our second year of these sort of like spread out events, it's gonna be culminating in a hack day in December, I think on the 3rd. And we hope you will be there for that. I was at the one last year and it was, it was a very cool scene. There's a lot of fun stuff going on, there'll be some prizes on that. So time's open. This is where we interface with you about technology. Today we're gonna to be talking about HTML5, which is a technology I care a lot about and has really become sort of not just the hot, cool thing, but the serious, serious thing. Uh, people around here take HTML5 and related web technologies really, really seriously now. Uh, people that you wouldn't even think, the people you think that would be so removed from technology that they wouldn't even know that word, they know that word here. This has really caught on in the mind of at least our leadership, and I imagine it might be with some of yours too. So we wanted to talk a little bit about not only HTML5 and where it's going, but sort of related technologies that the people who are excited by HTML5 are also excited by. So what we're talking about tonight, the topics we're gonna to be going over, sort of like my dream list of possible topics to go over. When we were sitting in the room, it was like, you know what I wanna talk about? I wanna talk about what's next for HTML5. I wanna talk about CopyScript. I wanna talk about Node.js. And it seems like everybody wants to talk about those. So that's what we got. And we have three great speakers for you to hear from, to talk about these topics, to show you what they're doing, to the, how they're doing it. And these are, these are technologies that we use here too. So this has our sort of full stamp of approval of things we think are cool. And if you aren't using these or don't know about them, you really should because these are all technologies that are on the rocket ship. So I think we'll start off. Uh, I'm going to be David Pembury, who'll be talking about Node.js. So, without further ado. Good evening. Uh, I'm David Pembury. Uh, I work at Lab 49. We're a financial technology consultancy. We help banks and hedge funds uh, build trading systems and analytic platforms. For the, first couple of year, the past couple of years, I've been working pretty much solely on HTML5 applications. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Node, giving a bit of introduction to what it is and why it helps writing these kind of new HTML5 web applications that we're doing. So, let's get started. Here's some code. You're probably expecting JavaScript. This is actually Ruby. Um, it's not kind of ambiguous. Uh, so, the line I want to draw your attention to here is the second line. Now, imagine this is taken from Sinatra, one of these kind of web platforms we have up on Ruby. This is actually a call to a database, maybe using an ORM like DataMapper or something like that. So think about what's going on here. 
we're doing this call saying, hey, I want to go and get a record with this ID. It's running off to the database. It'll take like you know 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, depending on how quick your data store is, and then return that result to you and assigning it to that variable. So here, everything's running synchronously. During the process of this call, it's blocked. Like while this is going on, what can happen here is absolutely nothing. So the way we actually build web service like this, if we only had a single kind of thread of execution doing this sort of logic, it would be awful for performance. So to scale this, we use multiple threads. Okay, this has served us pretty well over the past couple of decades for writing network applications. Um, most web servers we use, like Apache, are a thread per connection. However, each thread we have requires some resources. Each has its own call stack. To actually switch on to another thread while we're waiting for like, the database call or want to have something else execute, there's a cost to that. Obviously, computers are pretty quick at this nowadays. It's, it's, uh, it's not something we really worry about every day. But more appropriate to the stuff we do, imagine we had some shared state. So like, we want to count how many people we currently have connected to our web server. So for every connection that comes here, we want to increase a variable. Imagine two connections come in at the same time. We have two threads. We try to update the shared state. We can very easily get into race conditions. Now, there's lots of techniques for dealing with this, lots and such, but it's not necessarily easy. Um, and let's think about what we really do in our web applications or in a SAT on a web server. If you like, go off the databases we just talked about, maybe pull stuff in caches, talk to other servers, uh, or even just grab files on the file system to run these use with new data or whatever it is. So pretty much all this stuff is I.O. The, stuff, the kind of code we can write in our web applications is all just orchestrating this various kind of blocking I.O. operations. So there's actually another approach to writing these heavily I.O. bound systems called an event loop. As opposed to using threads to try and emulate this kind of synchronous behavior and uh, allowing these blocking calls to happen, in fact, in these systems, we just have a single thread. So all the code we're writing is just running on this single thread and can spin around. When it wants to do something, it'll actually call off and say, hey, go off to the OS maybe and say, I want to go and do this thing. Our web application can carry on spinning, doing its own thing. Um, and then when that call comes back, it'll actually call back into our application and say, now I'm ready. So the post to waiting for every operation, if we write our code asynchronously, we can actually just carry on plowing through. Um, and this event loop will us carry on like that. Um, so the whole idea of using like a single thread seems quite bizarre to start with. The most distance I've worked on, you normally associate multi-threading with performance. The typical example you see was Node is comparing it to a, a web server and reverse proxy uh, called NGINX. Uh, this is in an event loop. This only has a single thread. Um, these are the performance statistics that are typically used. Obviously, take this as a grain of salt. This isn't necessarily a realistic scenario. I think in this one, it's just downloading a half meg file for every connection. We can see, comparing the two between Apache and Nginx, <coughs> as we get more and more concurrent connections, uh, the requests per second they can process, uh, Nginx doesn't really fall off that much. It is very much comparable to Apache in this example, much better. However, where you really see the main resource difference, we're comparing how much resources they pick up, and this is uh, memory on the y-axis going up. Um, in this case, because every thread coming into Apache is allocating a new call stack, the amount of memory increases with every call that comes in. However, with this event loop system, because there's only a single thread there, it doesn't have to allocate any more. There will be a small amount for each connection coming, but it's no way on the same scale. Um, so if writing these event-based systems is a fairly good write, way of writing these heavily I.O. bound servers, why don't we do more of it? Well, it obviously happens, and GenX is. Uh, however, a lot of languages don't really help us writing these systems on a single thread. Like Nginx is probably written in C. Uh, we'd have to manage all our own shared state that way. It's obviously very possible, but it's not necessarily easy. Um, languages with straight kind of first class function support can really help us with this. So in that top example I've got up here, this is what we started with, with some Ruby code. So here we're kind of blocking and waiting for that result to come back and then use it from the media line. Very straightforward. Uh, on the second example, I've actually used a Ruby block we're effectively passing that person.get call. So when it executes that person.get, it can just plow on through and move on to the next thing. When that call comes back from the database to say, hi, I'm ready, uh, we can just jump into this callback function and execute it. Notice in Ruby, we have closures, which will actually pull in state from outside of that callback function. We can reference that ID variable from outside, and it will be available to us in that callback. Um, 
And sure enough, there are actually a lot of frameworks for writing these event-based systems for these dynamic languages. I don't have a huge amount of experience with any of these, so I won't talk them off too much. Um, but there are all frameworks built on top of these existing platforms that traditionally do the blocking I.O. And this is kind of where Node came from. Like, what if we actually just start from scratch was a platform which is great for building these event loop based network servers. Um, if only we had a language that great, had great first class function support um, and yet had no existing notion of how we do I.O. <laughs> you probably guess where this is going. And yeah, wouldn't it be cool if you already knew it? <coughs> We have JavaScript. So JavaScript came from being in a browser. It's always been event-based. Like we're used to doing things like setting callbacks for when we click buttons and things like this. And as a consequence of being in the browser from the get-go, like it didn't really have to deal with like file access or kind of dealing with other processes or anything like that. When people started introducing the notion of doing more kind of network-based I/O into the language, we ended up with AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, like doing all this these networking I/O calls in callbacks asynchronously. So it's kind of perfect for running these event loop kind of servers here. It's already doing it inside the browser. And that's kind of where Node came from. Uh, the idea of trying to build a platform that was really great for writing these type of servers using JavaScript and just doing everything again from the ground up. If you go off to the About page on the Node.js side, in the first couple of lines, you'll see a statement pretty, pretty <coughs> close to this. The goal of Node is making developing scalable, high-performance network servers easy. And that easy bit's important. The point of what I'm trying to show this evening is why that's the case and why it's easy for us web developers to start developing complex network servers in a language we're familiar with. So most of, a lot of people's impressions of JavaScript aren't necessarily positive. This comes from like all the runtimes like IE6 where it didn't particularly perform very well. However, nowadays, thanks to the great work that's going on in like Chrome by Google and other browser influencers, GSP, um, we have terrifically fast JavaScript engines, and nodes built on top of the V8 JavaScript engine you'll find inside Google's Chrome browser. All the libraries inside Node, pretty much, only expose non-blocking I/O operations, so it's almost impossible to block that single thread that's going around executing. No matter what you do, it's very difficult to actually stop it. So let's take a look at what Node looks like. So this is just a basic terminal attack. <coughs> I've already gone off to the node site, um, grabbed the source code, done a configure, make, make install. And this is just giving me a program I can run. So node is just a program. It's nothing that's stuck on top of Apache or an existing web server. It's an isolated name all by itself. Uh, just by typing node, I've got a recall that reevaluate print loop where I can execute JavaScript. Ooh. Correct JavaScript. So not very exciting by itself. Let's start by actually writing a basic Node program. So Node's meant to be familiar to us web developers, and there's a lot of stuff in Node that should feel familiar. Um, we've got console.log command. This is, you'll find this in any browser on site. Also, set timeout. This is the way in a browser you go around setting a timeout. So what I'm going to say is, I will and execute that after two seconds. If we go back and execute that program, let's take a look at how that executes. So it's saying hi, waiting for two seconds, and then printing world. What happened when it ran that is it started with the console.log, it printed out hi, then ran the set timeout, so actually say I'm going to need to do this in the future, and then effectively the program had finished. However, because Node still recognized it was a pending callback waiting to happen, it just sat there waiting until after two seconds of lapse, it was ready to execute that function. At which point, it did the world, found there was nothing left to do, and finished. Um, this next example is probably the one you'll find right on the top of the Node.js homepage. Um, here we're creating an extremely basic web server. So this is actually using the kind of low-level HTTP stuff. You wouldn't write a whole web application like this. Um, but it's showing quite how easy it is to make these kind of programs. So here, I'm requiring the HTTP library. Because JavaScript has no notion of like an import from Java, require, or anything like that, this is actually a global function that will go ahead and pull in a module for you. In this case, it's just returning us an object with the HTTP API attached to it. I'm immediately calling a function, create server, and passing it 
a callback. This callback again called for every connection that comes into Node um, we have to deal with. So it takes two parameters, a request, a response. Uh, the request, we can see details of what they've been requesting. The second one's a response, we can write stuff out. Here we're going to say the status code is 200, that means it's all good. Uh, set a header to say it's plain text. And then just give it some data to finish off with. Um, and I'm going to start that off listening. So it's effectively installing something in its event loop saying I'm waiting for the connections uh, on port 3000. I've actually run that up. Say it's listening. Start the browser. Okay. Oh, yes. Hmm. Uh, uh, oh, local host transposition. Okay. Spelling helps. Okay, that's been successful. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is the extremely basic web server. So to demonstrate some of these non-locking uh, IO uh, APIs, I'm going for the file system module. So the FS. On here, I have a helpful method called read file. And what we do is read a file from my local directory to send out the response. I'm going to give it a callback, which is a pattern you'll see a lot in Node. Uh, the first parameter is an error. Because it's executing asynchronously, we couldn't just wrap a try and catch around this. So in this case, if their problem happens during that read call, it'll populate this error argument and say this happened. If it didn't, it'll populate the data argument. In which case, it would have successfully read our file. Obviously, realistically, I want to deal with that error, but for the sake of time, I'll see if it'll work and just print out the data. So what's important to note here is from when we created the server, we've given it this callback for a request. So when my request comes in, <coughs> I immediately hand off to this fs.read file, at which point it's gone back to waiting on this IO operation. So in the meantime, Node can carry on spinning and processing more requests while these two things are happening. It's all happening asynchronously. So follow that again. And here we have a text file with all the information to my event. Um, so node chips is a basic amount of libraries. Nearly half the stuff in there is all for dealing with network servers. Um, you can also write your own libraries for node, and many, many, many people have. Uh, there's modules of pretty much everything you can think of already. Um, despite being a relatively new runtime, the amount of stuff you can do on it is quite incredible. You have libraries for parsing XML, wonderful. Uh, doing web services, uh, writing web applications, we'll get to. Um, dealing with graphics, calling APIs, and things like Twitter and stuff like that. You could all go and pull these down manually. Um, however, managing dependencies and stuff like that between them can get fairly difficult. Established platforms have package managers, like uh, Ruby has Gems, Java has Maven, um, and Node's no different. Uh, it's by NPM, originally named Node Package Manager. Um, it's actually been around for quite a long time, and it's probably contributed a lot to the extreme great growth of Node. It's very simple to use, like most package managers, <coughs> say install, it'll go off to the public repository and start pulling down modules and managing its dependencies. Um, just before this presentation, I went up to the actual public registry for NPM to look at the modules on there. So despite Node only being around for about two years, if that, there's already 3,000 projects available to pull down immediately. I also list the most dependent on, the top two being underscore and copy scripts. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, also, at this point, you can use CopyScript. All the examples here I'm using in JavaScript. CopyScript will work great too. I'm sure Jeremy will talk about that later. Um, so currently the most popular web application platform is something called Express. Um, this gives us routing, view, sessions. Um, and in fact, it looks very much like a JavaScript version of Sinatra, if you're used to that from Ruby. Here we're defining a kind of root, saying if someone tries to get the root of my site, render a view called index using this data and then we're starting up to listen on the board. Um, so I <coughs> spend the rest of my limited time talking about how Node compares with other known web application platforms. And what I really want to do is show you where Node stands apart from them, what it does differently. Um, I spent the past couple of years writing large client-side <coughs> five applications, and there's a couple of major problems I find. Um, one of which is platform consistency. Although it's all really nice to think about writing an application just for Chrome, uh, Firefox and recent versions of IE. Um, 
we should really strive to get our application working everywhere. Now, when I talk about things like this, people just assume I'm complaining about IE. 95% um, of the time, I probably am. But it's not just that. Um, browsers are every net nowadays. Like, they're on mobile devices, tablets, all that stuff, even ebook readers. Um, and these all have different capabilities. Now, with most traditional web application platforms, by writing these web apps, we can kind of think of them as two completely distinct sites. Like we have our Ruby or our Java or whatever else on our server kind of spitting out HTML, and then our web browser consuming JavaScript and HTML and kind of running all there. Like they're two very distinct sites, like two almost separate applications. But with Node, because we can share the language, we can share libraries, we can share a whole bunch of other stuff, it makes it much easier writing a single coherent application. They can really work together. Um, so what do I actually mean by that? Okay, so here is a basic example where I'm just pulling in a library called JS DOM, which I've downloaded off of NPM. Um, this is a node module which implements the browser-based DOM APIs. Um, it, doesn't, it isn't a full browser, it doesn't have a render or anything, but it does have this kind of node structure that we're used to from doing JavaScript on the client. Uh, so here I'm creating a window object, similar to like a global thing in a browser, and pulling out the document from it. From there, I can use the kind of APIs we're used to, like say, document.elements by tag <coughs> name, and I'm gonna pull out the HTML elements, so the root of the page, and hopefully there will only be one of them, at which point I can write it out. Completely empty HTML document. Not terrifically exciting. Um, however, because we got this DOM API, a lot of you are probably used to one of the most popular uh, libraries for interacting with a DOM in a browser is jQuery. And sure enough, despite not being an actual browser, we can load that in. In fact, uh, <laughs> using a helper method called jQueryify, I've actually just pulled down a jQuery here. Um, and it's going to give me a, what that's going to do is create a script element in the page uh, that will go off, load it from my local file system into its DOM, um, and then let me use it. So I can say window.jQuery to actually pull out a dollar from this browser object and then start using it. So I'm going to use jQuery to say uh, create an element, uh, add the class JS DOM, append it to Body. So this is just a jQuery we're very familiar with. I can then also use selectors to say, go into the DOM, pull out all gnomes matching a class with JS DOM, and then set the class to A, I'll set the text to A. I'll run the node now. You see it's loaded in jQuery, created us a div, added a class, and then was able to go back in and pull out that div by its class name. So this is pretty cool, but kind of gimmicky. Why is that actually useful? Well, who's got a smartphone on them? Like an iPhone or an Android? Most of you, feel free to get them out now. Um, I want you to go up. Uh, what's the Wi-Fi details? <laughs> I'm at chart.nodedemo.com. So while I'm talking, feel free to navigate to that on your phones. Um, so here I have an awesome HTML5 site. Uh, I'm taking some data in a text box and rendering a chart. Um, this is using a library called Tie Charts, which render these very animated uh, interactive charts on the client side. Um, if any of you have an Android device and are checking this out, it's probably not working so great for you. This is because it doesn't actually have SVG support in their browsers. Um, to give a much more extreme example, let's open this up in Firefox. Try it again, of course. And what I've done here 
is actually completely the same with JavaScript. So of course, any kind of JavaScript charting library we have running in the client is not going to run at all. Um, so yeah, it's effectively broken. However, all this high charts library is actually doing is actually using the DOM APIs to render a series of elements inside the browser. Like mm -hmm. down here, we have a load of SVG elements. High charts is just the JavaScript library. So using the very same techniques we showed, loading that into uh, Node, we can use the very uh, loading jQuery into Node. We can use the very same techniques to load high charts into Node. So I'm not going to code all this up now, but uh, here's a little example where I've actually loaded in jQuery and the high charts library. So this is exactly the same code I'm using on the client, uh, pulling it out of our Node-based document, creating a container for high charts to render into. Doing things, things with the option, some options for the chart, like turning off animation, which wouldn't really make much sense. Um, and then asking high charts to render into my server side DOM. At which point, I'm going to ask jQuery to pull out the SVG contents, so this is just the text of the SVG, um, <coughs> and then use a command line tool from Image Magic called Convert, where I can pump in that SVG and it will return me a PNG image, something that most browsers can display regardless of JavaScript. Uh, and then I'm going to buffer it and write it out. The end result is if I go to chart after .com, uh, .no demo .com, we try it in Chrome, or we still have JavaScript and SVG is enabled. You'll see it's still working normally the way we expect. Whereas if we do it in Firefox, where I have to save JavaScript, um, because now the client, the JavaScript on the client isn't handling that form post, it's going to send up to the server, at which point I load those same content into JS DOM and render that SVG into an image. So, here it is. So the next thing I wanted to talk about very quickly um, is uh, real-time data. So HTTP serves us pretty well. We can make a request to a server. It sends us a response back. However, it's not so good for pushing stuff. Like this is like chat messages, things like this, and most client web applications, or in my case, a lot of the time when prices change and stuff. We have a variety of techniques for dealing with this. Um, however, nearly all of those require holding connections open on the server for as long as possible. In most traditional web servers, they can really struggle with this. They were designed for taking in requests, dealing with them as quickly as possible, and getting them out as quick as they could. Um, Node wasn't built that way. So there's a small cost for it. It's actually quite capable of doing this stuff. Um, there's a library called Soccer IO which will negotiate with the client what transport it's able to use. So if web sockets are available in the browser, it will use that. Um, otherwise, it will fall back on like plugins or uh, long following. Uh, so just as a quick <coughs> demo of that, and to explain quite how easy it is. So in this little example, I'm loading up Socket.io, getting a listing on a basic web server. Socket.io is giving me an event, a callback, that whenever someone connects, what I'm going to do, per what I talked about earlier, count how many people are currently connected. So when someone comes in, I'm going to say increase my counter by one. Um, if you've done much multi-threaded programming, like a statement like that probably makes your stomach turn. However, because we're only on a single thread, we don't have to worry about this shared state. We can just update it quite happily. Once we've got that, I'm then going to broadcast out to everyone that's connected that my counter changed. And there's some code on the client for picking this up. And then when someone disconnects, I'm going to decrease the counter. File up. Open the browser. Typing sideways is very difficult. Here we have one person currently connected. What we're going to do is open up a new browser window, navigate to that same site, and it's managed to increase both of them. Um, do this again, increase it again. So, though this isn't a particularly exciting example, it does demonstrate quite how easy this kind of stuff is. And think about how different that would be in another kind of web platform. Like, you can do these things, but it's certainly not that easy. Uh, so a quick another example showing what it looks like on the client. Uh, here's an extremely basic chat example. If you've ever dug into Node, you've probably seen plenty of these things. 
Um, so here I have a form that's being submitted. I'm going to send the message. I'm going to say when the form is submitted, just give me jQuery. Stop it from posting to the server. Um, then event. I have a new message. And then reset it to an empty value. So that's all I need to send a message up to the server. And then on the server, I have very much the same code as you just saw. However, when someone sends in one of these message events, it's just going to broadcast it out to everyone. So then when I get a message that's been received, <coughs> all I'm going to do is create a new list item. Set its text and pretend it to my list. Now, if I go to chat.no demo, if you've got a mobile device handy, feel free to do that too. Watch your words. Run the same thing here. Uh, <laughs> oh, four, five? Wow, you're quick. So you saw how easy that was. This is no more than like 15 lines of JavaScript. It's kind of incredible. They build these really cool, wow. You're very quick on your phones. <laughs> no swearing. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Well, I probably have <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> Feel free to keep on chatting to each other. I'll be well. uh, okay, so very quickly, who's currently using Node? Well, the one that really blew me away is who has seen those like Palm Pre kind of WebOS phones? Like every one of those ships with Node in it already. Um, and if you write services for those phones, they're all running on top of Node itself. That's incredible. Um, but also, you should really look at Node and not being an all or nothing thing. A lot of companies now have started using Node just for the particular cases where it's really well suited and put it alongside their existing web applications. Just to name some examples, uh, Yahoo are rendering bits of a mail application, server side, browsers that don't support certain capabilities. GitHub run their downloads off of it, and they've actually blogged about this a lot, which makes interesting reading. Uh, Yammer run their API, and a company called Good Data do uh, the server side <laughs> charting stuff I showed you um, for rendering those chart server side. Uh, today, LinkedIn just announced that all their new mobile applications are completely back up with Node. Very cool stuff. If you want to go ahead and start writing Node applications, there's already a whole bunch of cloud hosting providers. Node Jitsu, blog a lot about Node, they're based in New York. Uh, Join to the people who employ Node's creator and NPM, so they're backing it heavily. Uh, Node.de. Uh, also, Heracure recently started supporting Node too, so you can publish applications up there. And one of the real takeaways I hope you get from this is that even if you don't start hosting your applications on Node, having a super capable JavaScript runtime is really, really great for when you're developing HTML5 applications. Like whether it's just running JS hints or JS lint for doing syntax checking with JavaScript, uh, running CoffeeScript, uh, running Archify for great minification of JavaScript, uh, an interesting tool, Zombie, where it's essentially doing acceptance tests like you would in Selenium, but it's all completely headless. And because it's all running in JavaScript using like JS Top and a bunch of other libraries like that. It's super quick. One of the last projects I did, we had uh, 15, 20 kind of very basic sets and tests that we run frequently. They'd only take like three or four seconds to run. Absolutely incredible. Um, so Node's very young still, it's 0.4. And the core's very stable. And the real growth we're seeing is in different libraries coming up, running on it. Um, it's a really exciting space right now. To actually get started, if you're on a Mac or in Linux or whatever, uh, you can just go off to the site, download it very easily, that's the main to make install. Uh, if you're on Windows, kind of a little stuff. You can uh, download Sigwin. Um, however, for the current unstable branch of Node, they're making a really serious effort to port it to Windows. Now, that seems laughable to a lot of developers, but I think that's really cool. So like, HTML5 is giving us this platform for writing rich applications that's going to be completely platform independent. And now Node's one of this great server-side runs of time, which again, can be completely platform independent. I mean, we have a great development stack that will just work everywhere. Even Microsoft is very serious about this, it's sponsoring development of it. Um, however, by far the fastest way to actually get started with Node is a simple Cloud9. If we're looking for an example of a great HTML5 application, this is pretty much it. 
It's a full IDE that will run inside a browser, so regardless of what you're on Windows, Chromebook, or whatever. Um, this thing will run great. You can create node applications, you can do it in Java, you can do JavaScript, you can do it in CopyScript. You can, uh, this is actually a debugger running here, so you can actually set breakpoints, uh, see stuff on the full stack, uh, drill into its own code, see variables. It's very, very impressive. So yeah, Node's super exciting. There's a massive amount of growth behind it, doing really, really interesting, disruptive stuff. Um, there's a mailing list and Google Groups, an IRC room, it's all very friendly. Uh, there's a book, Hands on Node, which is probably the best way to start learning Node if you like reading. Um, so, thank you very much. So, next up, we are going to have Jeremy Ashkenaz, who's going to talk to you about CoffeeScript. I am really excited about this language, so let's hear some more. Segue from the Node talk. Um, I'm at the Times on the interactive news team now, but uh, for the past years before that, I was working on Document Cloud, which is sort of a spin off of our Document Viewer project um, that got turned into a night news challenge. Um, and, uh, and so you'll see sites across the internet today, most notably The Guardian and The Telegraph, embedding some news of the world hacking documents um, on their websites using our Document Viewer. So that's actually an API where you know, the Document Viewer is a JavaScript application and it's all done completely statically. But, um, which is great because we don't have to worry about spinning up servers to handle the traffic from uh, you know, other people's news websites. But the problem with doing it statically is that we don't know when or where documents are being embedded. So the one dynamic piece of that is actually a node app where it hits a pixel to register the fact that a document <coughs> hasn't been embedded or this particular document has been embedded at this URL. And we don't want to have to go through the entire thick rail stack every time you know, a view happens on someone else's document. So node is a great way just to have everyone with that event loop, everyone hitting that exact same pixel and node keeping track of what the incoming URLs are. And then once an hour, it flushes all those hits to the database and we can know where the documents are being embedded. So that's one more use case a little bit closer to home. All right. There we go. So, um, CoffeeScript is a, uh, a little language, or at least I like to call it a little language, although I, I saw it as a fancy language in, uh, in David's slides, that uh, compiles into JavaScript. And um, it hasn't been around for very long, to give you a brief overview. Its initial release was done about a year and a half ago at an NYCJS uh, meetup um, not too far from here. Um, but the original version of the language was a good bit different. Um, we use colons for assignment, both in object literals and in variables, and functions work differently. And uh, if you remember why the Lucky Stiff's potion language blocks used to be ended with a period um, like that worked. And the original version of CoffeeScript was also written um, in Ruby, and it used a handwritten Ruby lexer and a rack parser. Um, but fortunately, sometime between 0.1 and 0.5 there, things started working to enough of an extent, and the language started covering a large enough area of JavaScript that it was feasible to write just about anything. So we went ahead and uh, rewrote CoffeeScript in itself, um, doing a straight port of the Ruby compiler, just translating basically all the same idioms into CoffeeScript committed in the repo right alongside of it. Um, using the Ruby compiler to generate, using the CoffeeScript source, the CoffeeScript version of the compiler. And then at a certain point, you know, there was a moment where um, then you could take that compiled CoffeeScript compiler and run it back through itself again and do that once or twice more to be sure that there wasn't anything funky lurking around. And then of course the next step <laughs> is to get rid of your Ruby and you're entirely self-hoisting and you can't go back. Because uh, one fun thing about doing that is that as you're working on a language, if you make an incompatible change, you break something, you've just broken your compiler and you can no longer fix it. <laughs> so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, git checkout, you know, dot, and then go back and try it again. Um, yes, yeah, so the general pattern of working is you make a change, <laughs> compile the compiler twice just to be sure, um, run the tests, and then you're probably good to go if uh, everything worked out. So why are we talking about this? Um, JavaScript is exciting stuff right now. Um, I tend to think of HTML5 as uh, taking JavaScript seriously. Um, you'll notice that tonight's talks, two of them are about JavaScript, and one of them is half about JavaScript. Um, so we now are in an age where we finally have true browser competition. Um, we have things like Node.js, and we have uh, fast JavaScript engines, very fast JavaScript engines, where it's pretty much the fastest dynamic language out there. 
Um, but the JavaScript renaissance requires your participation, right? This isn't something that's getting handed down from, you know, from browser vendors and from large tech companies. This is something that's getting pushed forward by libraries and people sort of demanding change in web APIs. It's remarkable how little has changed about the state of developing web applications in the last, you know, 10 years even. All of the sort of the basic ingredients, including, you know, XML, AJAX requests, um, date back sort of that far. So we're now at a stage where after remaining sort of stuck in the amber of time for almost a decade, JavaScript as a language is starting to come back to life. We now have a TC39 committee working on standards for evolving the next version of JavaScript. Um, and they want input from people who use the language. Um, it's, it's sort of the most, the most popular language for programming in the world just by the fact of it being the language of the web. Um, and as a, as a committee, TC39 you know, being answerable to all of the browser vendors, um, has a hard time reaching consensus, and it's a consensus process. So they'd much rather be able to standardize um, standards that exist in the wild. And the best place, the best way to experiment with standards in the wild is by is by doing experimental languages. So CopyScript is a little language that tries to play with what's possible in terms of JavaScript, um, trying to expose the good parts, you know, the famous good parts of JavaScript, while sweeping the awkward bits under the rug to as great an extent as possible. You know, it's not entirely possible, but um, as much as you can. For example, things like numbers, where the semantics of numbers you can't really change without really slowing things down. Um, and this comes from the perspective of someone who spends you know, most of their day writing JavaScript web apps and um, asking the kind of what if questions. So what if you don't have to worry about semicolons or uh, trailing commas in your apps? What if you don't have to wrangle with the prototype chain every time you want to make a new object without having to copy all your functions over? What would be the minimalist syntax for defining a function, or for defining a function where the value of this doesn't change out from underneath your feet when you pass it off to a callback? So the slogan of CopyScript is that it's just JavaScript. Um, and of course, I don't mean this syntactically because it can look very different, but semantically, um, JavaScript has a totally gorgeous object model and flexible programming paradigm sort of hidden underneath this traditional looking syntax. Um, and, and there's kind of the holy trinity present of scripting languages present in JavaScript. We have this highly dynamic structure, flexible objects where you kind of roll your own object-oriented programming through the prototype system, and first-class functions um, with closure scope. So well, with CopyScript, what we want to do is we want to embrace the limitations of compiling into JavaScript. We don't want to have an interpreter running in the browser. We don't want to have some kind of a VM you know, doing bytecode futzing. We don't want to be intercepting the calls that you make with your functions. We want to let that go through directly. We don't want to add too many special or any ideally special functions to the runtime so that you have to require a CopyScript library before your code will run. So this is a different philosophy than other compiled to JS languages like um, Cappuccino, I mean, sorry, like Objective-J or Move, um, where in Objective-J, for example, if you perform a call against an object, it wants to mimic method missing, so it has to dispatch that through a special function to check if the function exists or not. Um, but because the semantics of JavaScript are so flexible and so permissive, you can sort of stretch and smudge the language as you see fit. Um, it's a great compilation target for experiments. And in fact, you don't even have to actually compile to JS in order to compile to JS in a manner of speaking. So for example, this is JavaScript. This is a def.js from Tobias Schneider, which uses some fun value of tricks to give you kind of a funny Ruby-esque inheritance syntax. And this is fab from uh, Jed Schmidt, which is an amazing um, library, actually. This is just vanilla JavaScript, right? All this is is sort of a series of function calls getting chained together, passing in arguments. Um, that looks very lispy, but it's actually just JavaScript. But we're not talking about compiling to JS here. I mean, but we are talking about compiling to JS here, not just using the existing uh, JS parser. So this is some code that the CopyScript compiler produced. And in a perfect world, it would compile to the same JavaScript you would have written in the first place. That's sort of the goal, um, as much as possible. So one attitude is that you know code like this isn't that hard to write. Um, and it's true, it's not that hard. Lots of folks have their text editors tricked out to be filling out you know, the shorthand for setting up a prototype chain, putting in all the braces and everything you need. But at the same time, um, Dave Herman said this at a JS conf this year, um, that we should have real compilers being a compiler. You shouldn't have to do it yourself. So what kind of language features are we talking about adding to JavaScript here? Um, we're talking about significant white space and not having to sort of you know, declare your intentions twice with white space and with braces. If you're inventing everything normally, that should be enough for the compiler to tell what you're doing, what you're up to. Everything is an expression of sort of the big semantic change that CopyScript tries to make. Um, 
because we know how useful it is from languages like Ruby where every construct um, in the language is an expression and can be assigned to a variable or returned as the result of a function without having a sort of strange statement expression dichotomy where you can't use some piece of the program inside other pieces just because of you know, an arbitrary rule. So, so we try to do this as much as possible in CoffeeScript where everything that you can write has a value and can be used as an expression. A bound function literal so that um, you can declare a function with lexical this and your this will not change inside the body of the function you pass it off as a callback. Um, class sugar for prototypes, right? Prototypes are a great sort of um, under the hood way of tinkering with how your objects inherit from each other. But in practice, you want to have the way the code works and sort of the nature of the beast. And I think this is something that you know speaks to Plato and not to JavaScript is that you're going to have you know a user model or a person model or a window or an account or a browser. You know even in the language, there's things like string, regex, function that are effectively classes, and you have many instances of them, and they all behave the same way, and they have different sort of data attached to them. And so it's convenient to have a class trigger that will set that up for you correctly. Um, loops um, become comprehensions, right? Because what is the value of looping over a, an object except for the result of um, you know, the, comp the computed value of every single iteration of that loop? Um, structuring assignment, which is a fun idea that um, is also in the current proposals for the next version of JavaScript, where you can take a fancy JSON nested object and pull out the pieces that you're interested in into variables. Um, and then a few more that I think I will skip over because we only have half an hour for this and I want to have time for questions. And also, if you have questions about any of this as we're going, instead of waiting till the end, feel free to holler out or raise your hand. Um, so let's get started with some real code. Um, I'm going to try to hear this and switch on over to TextMate. Can everyone see that? Is that big enough? See some nods. All right. So to get started with the uh, CoffeeScript syntax, so here's a typical JavaScript function, right? We have a function called square. This is sort of my, my standard one. Um, takes in a variable x as a number and multiplies it by itself to give you back the result. So if we were going to say, what is the sort of minimal syntax for expressing this idea um, in JavaScript, what would it be? Well, first off, we can get rid of the semicolons, right? Because who needs those? We know where the lines end. Um, we can get rid of the braces and use significant white space to to declare our intentions. We can get rid of the var because the first time that we you know, use a variable as an identifier, it can handle that declaration for us. Um, we don't need the return, right? Because if everything in CoffeeScript has a value, we can use an expression. The value of calling a function is you know, its, its body. So square is a function that returns x times x. And instead of the long um, word function, we can just use an arrow. So the endpoint, the input of the function sort of points to what the output is. Um, so square is a function x that returns x times x. And indeed, if we compile this, we will see that we get back something very similar to what we wrote originally. And that works the same way. So now I can say, give me the square of five and run it and get, oops, I have to actually print that out. Console.log, as we saw before. This is all running through, so let me explain how this setup is working. Um, the CoffeeScript TextMate button just hooks into the command line, the copy command. So it'll be running your code with command R with um, through node, and uh, command B that I did before is just compiling and giving you back what the JavaScript is that then gets passed to node. All right, so some things in JavaScript already work great, and there's no need to, to fuss with them. Um, including the, uh, the you know, sort of beautiful um, object literals that we're used to in arrays. So arrays and objects are pretty much the same. This is actually written out um, a bit more concisely. But you know, if I compile this, you get what you'd expect, right? With the commas <laughs> nicely inserted for me without the trail in one and, uh, and all like that. So significant white space for blocks, right? If today is Tuesday, then it's time's open day. So if we run this, we will see that it is indeed Tuesday. Um, CoffeeScript, part of the idea is to, uh, I mean, part of the idea with getting rid of the syntactic clutter and, uh, and abbreviating things is to make it easier to read. So also, many of the common operators like um, is, you know, double equals, or in this case, is JavaScript, right? So triple equals, not, not double equals, have, a, have nicer English shorthands like is. Um, and if you want to see what this compiles into, you get hopefully the JavaScript that you expect. All right, so comprehensions. So here we've got an array of uh, three values, three strings, A, B, and C. 
Um, and instead of having to, so this is actually sort of one of the big things about JavaScript is that you can write out the for loop yourself by hand every time. You know, you can write it out very efficiently, caching the length so that you don't look up the length every iteration through, but it's kind of a pain to do that. So often we'll just use an each library, right? We'll use jQuery.each, we'll use underscore.each, we'll use array.prototype.foreach, which is actually a hell of a lot slower than, uh, than writing out the for loop by hand. So one of the nice things that CopyScript can do is to write that efficient for loop for you, and you can have the high performance code without having to twiddle with the array indexes yourself. So if we log every letter in this list, we get ABC, as you'd expect, and if we compile this, you'll see that we're getting the written out um, efficient for loop that you'd hope for. And um, this is a comprehension. So if I say that you know results equals letter for letter in list, you know, as a as a value, and then I console.log my results, we are going to get oops, I just switched tabs, folks. We're going to get an array back out of uh, A, B, and C. Or now I could say, concatenate some strings in here, I plus letter. And that's using the array as a comprehension. And if you compile this into JavaScript, you'll see that what it's doing is it's just setting up a, a, a results um, array and then pushing each time you loop, it's going to push the result of that computation and then give it back to you at the end, kind of as a map operation. So for most of the cases where you'd want to use a map or a um, filter um, or, a, or a select, um, you can use just a comprehension instead and get uh, better speed. And in JavaScript, sometimes you want to do comprehensions over arrays, sometimes you want to do them over objects or over ranges. So process in Node is the uh, global, or it's one of the global objects that has sort of lots of global variables on it. So if we look at everything that's on process, um, we find all of these fun <coughs> things in the Node API. And you can also um, do it for a range. So if you do have a start and end point, you're not going over an array, but you just have a place you want to start, a place you want to end. You do those kinds of loops as well. So everything is an expression. So this is, this is sort of the semantic difference. And the way that we accomplish this is by converting it into the expression form as much as possible. And if there is no expression form in JavaScript, you wrap it in the closure and you return the result of the computation. So we already showed you the, the console.log inspect business where um, it pushes the results into arrays, but you can do this for conditional statements, right? So here we've got one where if it's false, it's 100 or else it's 200, and I can now say console.log just around the if statement and run that and get back 200. Even for totally insane things that you never want to, not want to return as the result of a variable or a function, right? I can, I can assign the result of this try catch. So I call this console.log it actually. Or we'll just assign, let's show how that works. So um, try result is that. And then we're gonna log it at the end. Just run this through code. And so you'll see that we tried to call a function on an object that doesn't exist, and then we caught it and we wrapped it and we said, and the error is reference error missing is not defined using it as an expression. So one other fun bit of uh, CopyScript is you have this arguments, um, this is kind of a little thing, but it is convenient. You have this arguments object in JavaScript, which makes it very easy. You can pass any number of functions, any number of arguments to a function, and, um, and you can deal with it through the arguments object, but it's not a real array, so it doesn't give you sort of the nice array methods that you expect, so you often have to convert it. So splats, and this is actually something that's also um, being considered for the next version of JavaScript with the three dots on the other side, um, is a way to get a real live array out of the rest of the arguments to your function. So in this case, and we're also showing off um, string interpolation here, we're interpolating in values into those strings. So here we have a best actor function. The first argument to best actor is the winner, and the rest of them get turned into an array for others. We pass in four, and we get back out. The Oscar goes to Jibbo Nolan with three runners up as you'd expect. Um, the existential operator is a fun one. So in JavaScript, you have sort of a strange number of falsy values where things you expect, like null and undefined and false, are falsy. If you use them in a conditional, um, they will fail the test. But you also have things like empty strings and zero and things that 
are perfectly valid, zero is a perfectly valid value for a number to be, mm -hmm. you know, turning up falsy. So the existential operator is a way for you to say, does this value exist with the question mark? Um, so it's also a way to soak up um, values that don't exist. So here we've got an object with the name of Sue and Sue Jones and the age of 27, and we can log the length of Sue's name being nine characters long of, of that string. Um, but if I try to call the non-existent property on Sue, right, say this is the result of a fancy query against a times API that's giving you back a deep thing of JSON, and you're trying to look through a property, you're not sure if it's in this particular response or not, you're gonna get back out, you know, cannot read property existent of non. Um, so the existential operator gives you a way to say, does non exist? If it does, give me back the value of this chain. If it doesn't, I get back undefined because there is, it's like an undefined property. So in this case, I won't get the exception. It'll soak up the rest of the chain after that point. And it works the same way for functions. So here, reverse, if you know your JavaScript um, or API, reverse is not a method on a string. It's a method on an array. So if I try to call this, I'm gonna get back that has no method reverse, but I can soak up that call and only get it back if it exists. And it doesn't exist, so I don't get it back. But if I said name.split, and I run all this again, then I would get it back, the result. Alrighty, class literals. Um, this one's a bit snarky. But, uh, so, the, the way you want to demonstrate setting up the inheritance chain is, uh, is with um, sort of inheritance, right? In JavaScript, you have a prototype chain, you have an object, an object has a constructor that made it, the constructor has a prototype that has its default properties, and then that prototype can also have a constructor with another prototype, you know, sort of pointing back at infinitum, giving you this sort of chain of inheriting prototypal properties. And usually you don't want to let the chain get too long, but it can be handy for some sort of simple cases. So here we've got a newspaper class, it's got a publish function, right? Function, this one takes no arguments, it's just the arrow, and then the body of the function indented is to log out the news. So if we run this, we're gonna get the news with the new newspaper down here. Um, if we do an NYT, NYT inherits from um, newspaper, um, and it overwrites the publish function, right? So here we have um, extending and overwriting, um, and we get all the news that's fit to print. And if we do HuffPo, we get some recent headlines from yesterday and today, and then the news. Um, and uh, and here is the real sort of, so for a long time I resisted um, adding class syntax to CopyScript, even though it is convenient to set up the prototypal inheritance chain, um, until sort of we talked about super a lot, because super is the one thing, it's a huge pain to write super calls in JavaScript. Um, you can override an implementation of a function, but there's no easy way to get the handle of the parent class's implementation. Effectively, it's actually hidden unless you save a reference to it. And that's one of the big reasons why, you know, lots of people who write serious object-oriented JavaScript end up having to use a class library, because that's the only convenient way to get a super call. Um, and fortunately, by doing CopyScript, you can actually um, get a sort of um, performant implementation of the super call, because we know at compile time what the parent class was, so we can reference that function. I'll just show you, although it's gonna be a little bit messy, actually, because there's the boilerplate. This is sort of the standard business for setting up the prototype chain. Um, but we can actually say, look up the super reference on HuffPo and call that implementation of the same function. So there's your classes. Um, bound functions. So how am I doing on time? I know that we're not quite on schedule. Do you know right? Thanks. Um, so here we've got bound functions. If we have a person here, um, this is something I didn't mention before, but at is just a shorthand for this, so if you're doing lots of um, properties on this, you can use that for convenience, right? We've got a person, you make a new one, you pass in the name, um, it sets the name, and when you call introduce, it prints it back out. So if we've got Groucho Marx here, he's gonna say, hi, I'm Groucho Marx, right? This all looks pretty straightforward. Make a new person, call introduce. Um, but if you were to do this, right? If you were to say, say hi is the function Groucho introduce, and then call it, what would you expect to happen, right? Hi, I'm undefined. Groucho, by pulling off his introduce method, has lost his notion of what this is, and, uh, and no longer has reference to that this.name variable. But by declaring introduce as a bound function, so that's the difference between the skinny arrow and the fat arrow, 
he keeps the sort of the local um, scope of this, so this won't change out from underneath your feet. So now by doing fat arrow, Groucho Mark still knows that he's Groucho even after pulling off the introduce function, passing it to a callback, you know, passing it to jQuery, whatever the case may be. Bound functions. So pattern matching. Um, this is something that's also in the next version of JavaScript, where um, it's with the existential operator, it's useful for dealing with APIs, fancy APIs, where you can reach into a complicated object and pull out as variables the values that you want. So sort of the simplest case actually is just um, parallel assignment, right? A comma B equals one comma two console.log A. Pulling out two variables, so you can see what it compiles into, right? We, we cache the, the right hand side, we pull out A, we pull out B. When you run it, you get back the value you're looking for. But you can use it for arbitrarily complex um, JavaScript st structures. So here we have a fancy um, JSON object with a sculptor, a painter, and a poet. The poet's more blown out. He's got a name and an address, and the address has two different entries in that array. And so here we have sort of the, the mirroring of that same structure on the left hand side of the assignment. And this one's pretty complicated, but it can be you know, as clean or as complicated as you want it to be. We're looking into the poet, we're pulling out his name as a value, we're looking into the poet's address, we're pulling out the first line as the street and the second line as the city, right? And that's on the left-hand side, assigning it to the value of the futurist object on the right-hand side. And so when you run this whole thing, you get that F.T. Marinetti lives on the aroma. And the last but not least, um, David's web server, so what does this look like in real code and not silly examples? David's um, web server example from a few minutes ago, um, just the same sort of thing in CogScript, right? We're acquiring HTTP from Node, we're making a server with a function, um, writing out text plane, high end my times, and then listening on port 3000. If I run this, you'll see it logs the same. Listening on port 3000, if I switch to the browser, and go to localhost 3000, you'll get back way too small, high end my times. All right, so let me turn mirroring back off. That's sort of the whirlwind tour. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about build your own JavaScript, right? Lots of these kinds of features that are in the next version of, uh, of JavaScript, hopefully, um, or in popular JavaScript libraries, end up being implemented and prototyped in JavaScript first and then sort of standardized. So things like function.prototype.bind was in you know, prototype.js first and was in jQuery first before it ended up being in the browser. Um, and now we can all start to use it, you know, to greater or lesser extent, depending on the, what your browser support is. Um, you know, object.define property, the new ES5 API exists because of the how do we extend core JS objects in JavaScript um, problem. You know, use strict exists because as a community we've sort of come up with a sense of the kinds of standards you want to keep to um, when you're writing sort of large JavaScript apps. The JSON object exists because you know Crockford implemented it in JS first, and then it got moved into browsers, moved to the spec. The new array experts, right, that are now in ES5, map, reduce, filter, every sum, all of those were done um, in experimental libraries first. Um, so this sort of thing, this compiling language into JavaScript, um, isn't rocket science. And I want to give you sort of the encouragement to scratch your own itches with JavaScript, if you have any, um, and feel like it's something that you're capable of doing. And from a purely selfish, selfish perspective, by targeting JavaScript as your compilation target, you're sort of automatically getting code that runs you know, everywhere, right? It runs on the server and Node, it runs on all different platforms, it runs in the browser. And uh, it's also probably by virtue of running on V8 or running on TraceMonkey or running on um, Nitro, one of the faster dynamic languages um, out there, sort of for free. Um, and there's lots of interesting ideas sort of in the realm of programming that, that aren't in JavaScript and that people like to play with. So um, sometimes it feels like everyone who's ever you know, seen a programming language feature in a different language has uh, tried to add it to CopyScript, right? We've had patches for mutability, point-free style, macros, fibers, single assignment, yield, annotation, static typing, you know, semi-static typing, contracts. It's all been either suggested or proposed with a patch. And that's totally a great effort. Um, CopyScript isn't going to be the arena for it because we're trying to stick to this straightforward compilation into JavaScript semantics thing. Um, but there's lots of other languages that would be a good fit. So if you want to explore, you know, what can contracts do for web pro program programming, that would be a great um, experiment. You know, what would that mean for a Node.js app? Um, so with the goal of making it easier for you all to get started with this sort of thing, 
Um, let's scoot back over. The entire source code to CopyScript is uh, annotated um, like this. So, so yes, it is written in itself. You can see how we have the CopyScript source code. This is the source file that defines how the lexical scoping works, where you'll see things like adding a um, variable to the current scope, looking up if a variable exists in current scope yet or not, adding it as a parameter which doesn't have to be declared, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so with, this is sort of done with the hope that people will um, take it and do their own experiments. And there actually have been a number of interesting um, offshoots. There's the Coco language, which is sort of a more Perlish um, version of CopyScript with more shorthand and more emphasis on keeping it as dry as possible. Um, there's a new one with, uh, that basically changes the compiler to omit Google Closure compiler friendly code where everything is annotated with exactly what types it expects and what it does so you can get very good um, results when you run your JavaScript through Closure Compiler, and it can eliminate as much dead code as possible, which is a very interesting um, target. So, for example, here's the um, the grammar for CopyScript and how it works out. Right, um, a line is either an expression or a statement. So, there actually, despite the fact that everything's expression, a few things can't be. Um, uh, for example, return cannot be an expression because that wouldn't make any sense, right? And break, continue, things like that. Um, but you can get you can get pretty close. I'd look, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing a language that manages to get by without those things, and I think it's doable if you if you have everything be super structured, and your breaks implicit in the way that you would declare at the top of your for loop, you can probably do that. Um, in fact, right here, right, return throw comment and stand, uh, literal statements. And here's what expressions can be, right? Here's what a block of code looks like. It's indented, or it's either just a simple empty block, or it has a body to it. Um, an alphanumeric number or a string all this kind of fun stuff, right? You can see how this stuff starts to work, right? Um, so, swapping back in. Oops. The way that you implement this sort of thing, um, that, that grammar file is a, um, is, is using a, a language, or, or sorry, a library called Jison, which takes this sort of definition of what your, what your rules are for your grammar and it spits out a parser for it. Um, so there's lots of great language support in JavaScript, and I'll go over a few of those in a minute. Um, but one other thing I want to make clear is that, you know, with doing these little experiments, um, it's, it's okay to, to cheat. Um, CopyScript has a lot of optional syntax. Um, and so if it's not ambiguous, you might have noticed you can leave the parentheses off of method calls, you can leave the commas off the end of, of lists of things, you can leave the brackets off of object literals, um, and you can even leave the indentation out of the significant um, indentation. But all this optional syntax makes it really hard to parse. So another language with a lot of optional syntax, what does that say? Five, thanks. A lot of languages that are optional syntax, um, Ruby has a very hairy parser. If you've ever looked at Ruby's parse.y, um, last time I checked, it was 10,492 lines of sort of tangled yak um, with sort of arbitrary C code mixed in there. And we don't want to let things get quite, quite that crazy. So the CopyScript parser is only 600 lines of the JSON grammar with lots of comments, um, but we're cheating because the parser doesn't actually have to handle any ambiguities. We have a rewriter, which takes the stream of tokens and that's produced by the lexer and uh, disambiguates everything ahead of time so that there are no ambiguities. Um, exactly, it scans over them and it looks at all the places it says, oh, there's no, there's no um, open paren here because I see two, ident two identifiers next to each other. I'm gonna stick in the open paren and stick in the closed paren and then the parser doesn't have to worry about it. Um, so so that's, that's why CopyScript isn't actually technically parsable. Um, and it's cheating to make it easier. So they can feel daunting to get started. Um, here's some of the uh, tools that you can use to help. Um, we're using Jison, which is the, the um, Bison-esque um, parser generator. There's other good ones if you prefer parsing expression, expression grammars, which are a different style uh, entirely. There's good libraries for that and all kinds of, of other ones. Um, and that's the end. Now that, now that uh, David's used return and I've used this, we're going to have to see what you come up with. I've got to change some slides now. you got to close, close HTML. <laughs> um, so, so if you've ever been afraid to work on something language-y, um, don't be. It's all just code. And if you feel comfortable designing a nice API, you should feel comfortable you know, designing a nice syntax. Um, and don't wait for browsers to give you the language you want or for ECMA International or Guido or Maths to give you the language that you want. Give yourself the language you want today. Uh, thanks a lot. Open it back up if there's specific questions for Jeremy. Yeah, uh, 
if uh, if there's an error in your code in CoffeeScript, how do you unwind the line number? Like the JavaScript will tell you that the line number is 30, and then you have to back that into the CoffeeScript. Or how does that work? You do indeed um, at, at this point, yeah. So so our sort of take on that um, so far has been, because we want to be able to deploy this stuff in the browser um, sort of seamlessly, the goal has been to compile into as readable JavaScript as possible to not make that too much of an issue. It's not like debugging Minify.js. Ideally, it should look very familiar to you. And um, in practice, right, so that's the number one concern. In practice, people who actually use it don't have that problem. They have lots of other problems, and I, and I have lots of other problems debugging my copy script, but that particular one isn't really an issue because worst case scenario, you look at JavaScript and say, oh, it's that function, and you know where to go. That said, um, um, browsers are working at the moment because of Minify.js and because of languages like CoffeeScript to make it possible to have in V8 and in the you know um, Chrome inspector and Chrome debugger to actually have the correct CoffeeScript source file or to have the source file for your Minify.js. And the way that's going to happen, it's both a Google Summer of Code project right now and the ticket for um, WebKit and for um, Mozilla in Bugzilla is to produce basically a JSON, it might not be JSON, it might be some other kind of format, but a source mapping saying what the points are in your um, target JS that map up with your original language, whether that's CoffeeScript or your unminified JS or whatever the case may be. So that hopefully that will be the way going forward. Just a very quick suggestion when compiling code for debugging, uh, even though minification strips out all comments, if you modify your minimization to include line number comments every couple of lines, the break that will inherently happen with JavaScript in the debugger will show the comment plus or minus a couple of lines. Right. That's another good way to go is to spit out the line number comments. Yeah, just a yeah. thought as a suggestion. Yeah, so that's actually that's actually the way that some of this has been done before. And for example, there's been um, I know this has been done for yeah I know it's been done but it's been done in browsers specifically for for languages like um, SAS and SCSS that compile the CSS and then they have a Firefox extension that reads those comments far older than that oh definitely so but then but these source maps for the browser will hopefully be a standard so that everyone can do it the same way in the browser to get it to match up you got one yeah. Yeah. all right so you said that. People don't have that problem as much as they think, but they do have other problems. Yes. Like what? Other problems. Well, okay. So the, the biggest problems that, that people get stuck with at the beginning are, um, and this is something I didn't mention. So you might have noticed that there's no bar in CoffeeScript, and the reason that there's no bar in CoffeeScript is because, it's like how kind of like how Ruby does it, the first time that you use a variable, it's gonna it's gonna sort of declare it for you in terms of what the JavaScript does. Your variable is going to be declared in the closest. It's going to be declared in the closest lexical scope that it can. So if it's only used in the inner function, it's only going to declare the inner function. If you use it out here and then you reference it inside of a closure, it's going to share that reference. So um, part of this means that at the top level, we don't want to be leaking any, any of these auto-declared variables out to global scope. So all of your CoffeeScript code is wrapped in a closure by default. So the number one question is, I wrote my callback function, why isn't HTML seeing it? Why can't I do div.onclick equals my CoffeeScript function? And the answer is because you didn't export it globally to window. Right? It's inside of the closure, like a nice namespace thing. And because you didn't stick it on window, HTML can't see it. And so, you know, it's, it's a very different default in JavaScript where everything is global by default unless you sort of explicitly wrap up your code. But I think it's a good one despite that sort of um, beginning frustration. So let's see, that's one of the big ones. Um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one. Um, how do you test uh, applications that are written in CoffeeScript? The exact so basically um, another one of the deals with being straightforward one to one into into JavaScript more or less is that you can use any JavaScript library. Um, you can it's sort of completely interoperable, right? If you if you're using a JavaScript library, you might not know that it was originally originally written in CoffeeScript in the first place because there's no difference in how you call the functions. Like for example, that last bullet point on the on the Node talk, Zombie.js for doing the headless testing is actually a CoffeeScript app. Um, so use whatever JS testing library you know floats your boat. You can test it with QUnit if you're doing the browser. You can use um, Bows or Node Unit or whatever if you're doing it on Node. Um, I tend to just use the built-in assert module. So in fact, we're in the CoffeeScript directory right here. So if I do bin slash coffee is my uh, local version of the compiler, and if I do 
There's also a simple build tool that comes with it called Cake. So Cake test is going to run all my tests for me, and there's there's the test suite right there. A little bit faster the second time around. Anyone else? All right, we'll have time for more questions. We'll wrap up the more questions after the, the, the third session. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. The first time I heard a talk about CopyScript as a long-time JavaScript developer, I wanted to use it just for the or the dip existence operator with the question mark. Have you did? The oh. number the number of annoying lines of code where I'm testing for the existence of a nested object property is just existential. <laughs> Beautiful thing. <laughs> Very, very, very excited about some of the things that I heard about. Um, there's just all kinds of new stuff happening in the browser. We're like, it seems like we spent a long time as web developers getting browsers to be sort of on par with each other and remove as much suck as possible <laughs> from our development environment. And what I what I'm seeing now is we're really plowing forward and just doing things I wouldn't have even thought we could be doing in the browser. A lot of that is coming through Google and Chrome and soon to be in a browser near here. So without further ado, awesome. thank you very much. All right, well, thank you guys very much for having me. It's kind of cool and exciting to be here. Um, when I was thinking about what to really talk about today, uh, the original thinking was, okay, like there's lots of cool HTML5 stuff, but I kind of thought you guys might have already started playing with it, you know, might have already seen some of the cool stuff. So what's the new stuff? So just out of curiosity, how many people have, have dived in reasonably well into HTML5, you're building stuff today? Okay, so about, about half the folks. So I'm gonna talk about a bunch of stuff today that is the stuff that you can't really play with today. You can't play with it tomorrow. You might be able to play with it in a couple months. But it's stuff that's coming up within the next couple of months. It's stuff that still, if you play with it today, it may not work tomorrow, right? <laughs> like as, as the new browsers ship, as, as the specs change. These things aren't quite ready for the real world yet. So I'm going to talk about a couple of the new semantic elements, uh, some of the new JavaScript APIs, some of the richer integration that gives us better access to the hardware in our machines and, and uh, some performance stuff, uh, and then the devices. So I'll jump into semantics right off the bat. This is a really neat one, uh, the details um, element. It's kind of funky because it allows you to get that um, sort of have stuff open and close really easily. So I've got the details element. You can see here I say details open equals open. You provide a summary and then some content, and you end up with something that looks like this, right? Or if you wanted to do this in the past, you had to depend on some kind of library, or maybe you were going to go and use just a bunch of JavaScript and, and write it yourself, right? Where you just go and say, well, I'm going to go hide this element. When you click on it, I'm going to show it when you don't. Now all that is built into HTML as an element, so you don't actually have to go and do any of the crazy that you had to do in the past. Um, output is another new one. Basically go and, and fire results based on what's going on. So I've got a range element here. That as I move this guy around, I can see what the output of this range is. So I can see, hey, result value, value is a number, and I just add the two. And sure enough, as I go and I start, do, you know, you can actually get in real time with almost no JavaScript written all of the results from different inputs going up together. So it's a nice, easy way to be able to get access to some of the stuff you haven't been able to do before. Everybody seen Bacon Ipsum or Developer Ipsum? <laughs> no, another fun, <laughs> dorky one, right? Like, okay, well maybe Bacon Ipsum is an HTML5, but um, so 
the mark tag, right? So if you've got elements that you want to go and highlight, right? Think of when you go do a search, you end up on some web page, and it highlights your key search terms. You could do those yourself with a span, or maybe you're going to wrap it in a div or something like that. But there's no semantic meaning to that, right? There's no, there's nothing for the browser to really know about. Accessibility doesn't help in accessibility at all. So all you have to do is just add an open mark and close mark tag around the words that you want. I've gone and styled them a little bit so we get some pretty colors and that kind of stuff, but you can style them however you want. So I just added some uh, blue and, and uh, red, just depending on what, uh, which one you're on. We showed this at, at Google I.O. I've showed this one a bunch of times. This is one of my favorite ones, especially to demo live, only because a live demo of any kind of speech input um, always gets a little bit fun. Let me just actually make sure I have a good network connection. All right. So you can add this on any element today. And this is actually one I tell a lot of folks, like if you've got a search box or you've got something on your page and you want to go do it, like add this today because if it doesn't work, nobody's going to notice, right? Like they're not going to see that uh, speech input box. But if they do, they're going to be like pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so <laughs> go click on this. The rain in Spain. I like that because it's kind of fun. It's a little complex. And so sure enough, you know, you get the rain in Spain. So it just takes your voice, it, it sends it up to the cloud, figures out what you said, sends it down, sticks it in. Did the same demo with one of my coworkers a couple of months ago. And uh, he's from Spain, so he's got a very thick Spanish accent. And I'll, sh I'll show you something here. So there's a set of APIs that will also give you all of the things that that person possibly could have said, right? So you can go through and see what else they might have said if it really isn't sure. So, it's got a confidence level of 93, 90, almost 94% that I said the rain in Spain, right? Ah, it did it to me. Third one down. The way to S star 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 star. <laughs> right? Like, unfortunately, it won't give you the fun words, but you can you can get an idea. So you can see if the person says something where you're not quite sure that they said what you're looking for if you're trying to do a search. Maybe you're trying to do some kind of training application where they have to go and say something. So they're maybe doing radio training. You know, car one to car two. Is it what you expect? Yes, yay, you can use that. Is it not? Okay, well, is it close? Maybe they were mumbling. So there's a bunch of really neat things that you can do with this. Mobile devices, right? Like, you want to put this on a mobile web app. Great. You now can do speech input just like you can on your phone on, in the browser. So JavaScript APIs, here's one that I think is fantastic. How many people use jQuery or something, some other library in their stuff? Yeah, pretty much almost every hand goes up, right? jQuery is just one of those things that everybody uses every day. But one of the things I tend to use it for is adding and removing classes. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to use jQuery to go do that, you could actually go in and say, hey, I want to do this. So document query selectors. Query selectors is just another new HTML5 piece. And it just does a, a query selector and, and gets the first element that matches that particular uh, uh, CSS query. right? And then I say dot class list. And classless gives me all of the classes that are on that attribute. Now I can do dot add, I can do dot remove, and I can do dot toggle, right? So by doing dot add, I don't have to worry about putting spaces in, I don't have to worry about making sure everything's like, you know, properly quoted. I don't have to worry about that if I'm gonna do it manually, because maybe I don't wanna put jQuery on my page for whatever reason. So I can go in and just use add, remove, and toggle, and sure enough, Nice and easily, I'm able to get all of the, the styles and stuff that I want to get without having to do anything just crazy or, or rely on libraries. Data set is another one, right? Like, if you're trying to store data on elements, easy way to do that, jQuery or some other library. But if you don't want to go that far, you can actually go and use the HTML5 specs, right? Actually, this one 
is fairly well supported right now. You can use this in, in a lot of browsers. If you can't, you can usually fall back to a bunch of libraries without too much trouble. So you can go in and say, hey, data ID, good, right? Data name, Joe, and data screen name, user one, right? So then as we go through and get our, our keys um, back from the elements, if you ask for data ID, it's not going to give you the ID of the element. It'll give you the ID that's associated with data dash ID, right? Um, so name, obviously, is coming from data name. Interestingly, it gets camel cased if you use hyphens in there, right? So we go from screen hyphen name to screen camel case name, right? Um, match selector. So you can check to see if a particular element, again, these replace a lot of uh, the things that you would have used in libraries and stuff like that. So now you can say, hey, I want to say, does this element match a particular selector? So you can say, hey, is the data type a tweet? Yes, it is. Okay, great. I want to go in and do something in particular with this. Maybe I want to go back and use that class list and add a class. Or I want to go and do any particular things uh, that way. <coughs> Match media, um, form factor detection, right? Everybody's familiar with, with uh, media queries in CSS where you can say, hey, I want to go and, and apply this particular style, but we don't have an easy way that we can do that with JavaScript. So with this, we can actually do it with JavaScript. I can get resize my window down, and it, sure enough, it changes to be um, on an iPad or on a tablet. I can keep going down and it'll eventually go to um, a phone. So you don't have to think about, oh, okay, well, I need to do this, I need to do this. Oh, well, I just, I'm going to listen for screen resize events, right? Because listening for screen resize events can get to be a bit of a pain. You can go and just very quickly apply anything based on the CSS style or the CSS uh, media queries. All right. How many people have tried to do any kind of cryptography or like random number generation with, with JavaScript? Yeah, like a couple people. It's one of those ones you just can't really do easily because there is no random number, true random number generator in JavaScript until now. So now I can get a cryptographically strong random number seeded through the OS, right? So the OS is gonna go and, and do that crazy stuff if the OS can't provide it back to me, um, I'm going to get a, a not supported error, right? So maybe your, your device, for whatever reason, isn't able to generate that particular random number, so you'll get uh, not supported. But sure enough, you can get go, and I can click on this for, for hours and hours and hours and days. This is actually a, a real set of random numbers. So if you do need something for whatever your application, whether it's cryptography, maybe you want to make sure that you do have a good set of things going, you've got this uh, window.crypto. Um, I, so I had never seen uh, CoffeeScript until tonight. Um, and I got to say, I'm not a huge JavaScript fan. Like, I much prefer to do design stuff, but I'm not very good at it. I like CoffeeScript a lot. but. This is one of these things. Window on error makes my life much easier, and I think makes for a better experience for a lot of our users who are coming onto our websites, right? Because maybe they're sitting on something and, and oops, well, your coworker, because it would never be us who would introduce a JavaScript bug or any kind of bug, right? Like, we're all good enough that it's always that person sitting next to us. Um, well, if that's the case, you want to be able to catch those errors before somebody sees them, right? You don't want that, hey, this thing just failed or, or whatever just gone on. Well, the other cool thing is when you do catch those messages, you can use analytics. Maybe you use an XML HTTP request, and you can send those back so that you know when errors are happening, you can figure out what's going on with your code on remote machines, right? So that you don't have to go, oh, well, everything seems to be working because we're not hearing anything from our users and, and they seem to be going strong. 
well, nobody's actually getting past, you know, maybe the third page or whatever the case is, but they're not telling you about it. So with this, I can go make a boo boo, and sure enough, I, now, you know, I'm, I, this is a kind of lame example here, but I just popped up an alert that says, hey, uncaught reference exception, awesome undefined function that blows up my app is not defined. There's a surprise, right? Um, so it means that you can catch those errors much more easily. You don't have to worry about what's going on, where things are, are breaking, or, or, why, or why they're breaking. All right. Or that function can kill your, your presentation. <laughs> All right, let's pop back over there. How many people have tried to do any kind of binary data stuff on, uh, uh, in JavaScript? Yeah, um, so to the three of you guys, you, you rock. Right? Like, it's not easy, right? It's probably one of those things where you have to encode stuff, you have to deal with this and that. You want to do any kind of image manipulation, you want to do any kind of audio manipulation or, or transfer audio data, it's just not something that's really easy to do. So one of the new things that's come online, and this is actually something you can play with reasonably well today, is typed arrays. Basically gives you an array of a specific type so that when you put information or data into that set of, uh, of arrays, you know what it is, right? So it's either an, an int, an 8-bit int, maybe it's a 16, 32, whatever the case is. What this is really, really useful for is doing any kind of WebGL work. So if you're doing any kind of WebGL where you're manipulating graphics and you've got to deal with any kind of crazy, you know, image manipulation, you really want to have a strongly typed set of, of data that you can then go and use. So with typed arrays, you can go through and actually go do that. It makes things a lot easier. I'm going to show you an example of a, a place where we use that in an app that we built um, that's kind of fun. Um, spell check APIs. Chrome has it today, so like, you know, you're, you're going through, you're typing up a blog post, or maybe you're, you're doing something and you spell something wrong and get the little squeak squiggly line, right? That's great. But sometimes there are words that we just aren't in our dictionary that you might use on a regular basis or your users might use on a regular basis. So with the spell check API, you can actually add new words to the dictionary. So that as the user's going and typing in, you can provide both those words and suggestions for what the cor correct thing to do is, right? So I've got here where, well, we spelled chromium with a W, so you can go and, and provide a couple options back for what these guys are. So this is, this is one of these ones. Right now it's like way, way, way early in, in spec. It's only available in chromium nightly builds, right? So this is not something you really want to start playing with probably at this point, but it's something to go give a shot and have a look at because really this is the time for us as web developers to provide the right set of feedback to the W3C and to all the working groups so that they can go, hey, yeah, this works, maybe this doesn't work, or maybe we want to have a different set of APIs, right? Like, why are we going to go and, and use these particular things? The page visibility API? How many people check to see how many people's uh, websites depend somewhat on ads. Alright. <laughs> so about a, about a quarter to a third, right? That's actually kind of important, right? If people are opening your pages and looking at them, you want to know, because 